Well, good morning, good afternoon. David Willis here and welcome to our February Willis and Friends. And I'm really thrilled that you're joining us today. Um, our early relational health coordinating center at the SSP seeks to advance the framework of early relational health across early childhood communities and to make visible, innovative, scientifically based and impactful approaches. And to do so with careful attention to racial justice, anti-racism and health equity. All of our efforts are to bring about a paradigm shift for child health care transformation and community building. And I'm always so fortunate with these sessions to share with my most valued colleagues, national thought leaders, for old friends and new friends who inspire me as they embrace this framework of early relational health equity and put it into actions. And that's surely true today. Let me set this context for today's session, which we are calling um, the, um, the focus on toy pollution and relationships themselves. So let me set the context here for this month's work. I've long been an observer of caregiver infant interactions and have witnessed how objects become a part of many parent-child interactions. And sometimes the focus of the interaction and perhaps, perhaps even the distraction within those interactions I've always wondered about how toys, especially those with strong auditory or visual characteristics, capture the attention of babies and toddlers and what significance that might have to their social interactions, their social emotional development. Of course, toys are ubiquitous in the lives of all infants and young children and bring great joy to parents and their caregivers as they use them for engaging, for stimulating, for entertaining their young children. These shared interactions and experiences are foundational to human development and future well-being. But at the same time, we are aware of the developmental risks that kids can experience if there's too much individual screen time, too much TV time, or even perhaps too much um, screen time video toys. So as we advance our knowledge and perspectives and research about infant parent interactions and these important foundational relationships, it's worth considering the benefits and the risks of toys in the development of early relational health and future well-being. And it's in that context that I've raised the question about developmental vulnerability from toy pollution. And I've longed for infant research to help us understand that the value and risks of objects within parent-child interactions that will allow us to bring ever more guidance towards building strong, foundational, stimulating, important relationships and well-being. That's what we're going to get to talk about today, and I'm really excited about it. And let me introduce first Cynthia Frosch, who I met because of a paper that came out in 2019 called Parenting and Child Development, a Relational Health Perspective. I was so excited. I reached right out to Cynthia. We connected and we started, we had the first conversation I think we had, Cynthia, we actually raised that question about toys, objects, and interactions and our thinking. And then you and I have had conversations over the years and then today you've brought along a couple of colleagues but let me tell you first about cynthia she's an associate professor at auburn and an endorsed infant mental health um, mentor she earned her doctoral degree in developmental psychology from the university of illinois or vanish and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the center for developmental science at unc dr frosch's interest includes relational health parent-child interaction birth to five and practice reflection. And Dr. Frost serves on the editorial board for infancy as a member for the Society for Research and Child Development and the World Association of Mental Health. She has extensive experience in training researchers in the observation and the rating of parent-child interactions. So Cynthia, I'm thrilled you're here. And can I turn to you to introduce your friends who are now my new friends, both Sheila Schultz and Adriana Baird. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, David. It's great to be part of the conversation. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Sheila Schultzeth. Um, Sheila is a graduate student at Auburn University who's interested in social emotional development and relationships. She comes to Auburn with an incredible amount of experience having started her own nonprofit organization. She also has a master's in education from Harvard and is really interested in working with families. Um, to support optimal relationships. So I'm delighted that she's working on a video-based coding project with me, and that's some of the data that she'll talk about today. So Sheila, thanks for being here. 
Um, and then I wanted to bring along Adriana Baird, who I've known probably close to a decade now. Um, I consider Adriana one of the, um, the best thought partners I've ever had in terms of thinking about parenting, parent-child relationships, healthy families. She's helped me grow so much in my own thinking. Um, she serves as the program manager at the University of Texas at Dallas Center for Children and Families. She oversees the Wago Comigo program, the Play With Me program there, which is a relationship-centered outreach program directed to children ages zero to three and their caregivers. Um, she comes with extensive experience. She's a licensed uh, professional counselor in the state of Texas as well. Um, and a volunteer bilingual counselor for an organization serving victims of sexual abuse in Dallas. So I'm really grateful that um, both of these amazing colleagues were here today to talk about their experiences, both from a research perspective, but then also from a practice perspective. So thank you both for your willingness to join the conversation today. Yeah, I'm so excited about um, all of us joining together in this conversation. And Let's get started. And um, I'd like to give each of you an opportunity to reflect on my comments. What I raised about this question of toy pollution, reflecting on your observations, your experiences, and your research perhaps. And what have you seen about the role of toys or objects in young families' lives and how they might impact important foundational relationships, parent-child relationships, early relationship health, or what we need to keep our eyes on. Cynthia, can I start with you? Then we'll go to Adriana, then to Sheila. So I want to send you your thoughts. Yeah, so when I first started um, watching videotaped interactions as part of research, probably at this point about two decades ago, um, one of the things that was curious to me was how some mother-infant pairs or father-infant pairs could go five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and never make eye contact or share a vocalization or have a moment that suggested some sort of emotional communication. Um, and that was really curious to me, but I didn't really know how to capture it. Um, and most of the interactions that I was watching for research at the time were toy-based interactions. Um, and so over time, and just in conversation with various um, research colleagues and in doing this work for longer and longer, I got really curious about the space between um, two relational partners, parent and infant or caregiver and infant. And I got really curious about methodology and rating systems for trying to capture what was going on in between. Um, and so that kind of brings us to our conversation today. And the I think the movement in our field um, to be focusing on relational health. Um, you know, sort of recognizing that each relationship is individual, that a parent may share a unique relational experience with each of multiple children in their family or caregivers. Um, and so this idea of like trying to capture that space between is what has really captivated me in uh, recent years. And so to kind of address your question, one of the things that Sheila and I wanted to do was to go back and to look at some of the video based interactions that have been coded using other rating systems um, to try to see like what's going on at the mutual level, what's going on at the relational level, what's going on at the dyadic level, and see if we could describe that um, in a way that was more holistic, more complete than just looking at the parent's behavior and the infant's behavior separately and then trying to approximate the relationship. And that brought us to our current project, which um, we're calling ICU, which C standing for shared emotional experience. Um, and what we did is we went back to those interactions and we said, okay, how do, in this case, moms try to initiate interaction with their infants. Is it with toys or is it not with toys? And does one of those different techniques um, increase the likelihood that an infant would have and achieve a shared emotional experience with the caregiver, the, in this case, the mom? And so that's the coding that we've been doing. And just to give you the kind of the short answer, um, to what we're finding. And again, these are just preliminary findings, something that's capturing our attention that we're expanding our research efforts on. 
um, in collaboration with Margaret Cheshawan, who's also at UT Dallas, and also Samantha Reddig, a graduate student at UT Dallas. She's part of this project. But we're finding that when toy-based initiations are used by parents to engage their infants, it's unlikely that they're going to have a shared emotional experience. But when parents are engaging in this case, again, mothers are engaging their infants without toys, we're seeing a much higher frequency of shared emotional experience and a longer duration of shared emotional experience, which gets kind of to the heart of your opening comments, David. Um, I think toys have tremendous value in the lives of young children, particularly for the establishment of joint attention stimulation of cognitive development and so forth. But in the realm of shared emotional experience, the sweet spot, what we're seeing is that um, infants and mothers are achieving that more frequently after non-toy based initiation. Well, that gets us right into it. That's really good. Uh, you can imagine the number of questions that are coming into my mind, but let's give each of the other, um, your friends, the opportunity to reflect on these first thoughts. Adriana, your experiences, your reactions, your thoughts. Yes. So my first reaction is that whatever you see playing, in, what you see in, what you see happening with the toys is a reflection of what is happening with the relationship between the child and the mother. So for me, toys are tools that we use to not only the toys, but the objects around the child environment are like the tools that we use to promote different areas of development or different skills. The thing is, the toys are important, as you were saying, but even more important is who, how is this child using the toys and whom is this child playing with? So if depending on my parenting style, the way to connect with the child, I might be a parent that promotes or in a way hinders the, the development of the child's uh, skills. But that's how I see it. And I and I think like um, if I see a parent that naturally engages with the child, follows the child's lead, reads the child's cues, when we give that parent toys, they use those toys in a more efficient way. That's what I see in my uh, everyday uh, interaction with parents and toys. Like as you were mentioning earlier, I, I direct the Play With Me program. I was there just this morning and I was observing parents interacting with different toys and with children of different ages. So I always see this at play. If these parents are naturally interacting with the, the children in a sensitive way, the same kind of like dynamic you see play out when they are using the toys. Adriana, that's so important. And you said two things that jumped out to me that we can dig deeper in and that uh, toys are tools and they may serve different developmental purposes and not all toys are the same exactly. and and then also the toys as facilitating the enjoyment of the relationship itself there's a lot there to unpack and to think about that's great to get us started adriana thank you and sheila what are your thoughts and join us your reactions it was, it was so helpful to hear adriana speak of her experience um i'm glad that you were able to come especially after just seeing um, parents and infants working together this morning. So my part of what we did was to take a look at the videos. They were um, in five minute and uh, segments of several different, lots of videos. And to de determine what we saw, what choice did, did moms make with their six month old infants? And um, there's, we have data behind it to try and start to tell the story about what might be happening. But what was really impressive to me was that there's a high level of effort from the moms and really wanting to engage with their infants. They may do it differently, but there are moms just really trying to make a connection in some way. And so what I like about what Adriana said is through the work of helping parents better understand meaningful ways to engage with their infant and what the context around that might look like, depending on what their goals are, I think it is a really valuable conversation. Parents want to engage, they want to make good choices. And this idea of having a relationship with their infant, I think is kind of magical for them. At least that's from the conversations that I have with parents now as I do this work on infants and relationships and early relational health. The concept is powerful for them, like, well, what do I do? And so I love that opening um, to have the exploration and have the conversation. 
Sheila, that's so powerful. And it makes me think about, you know, when we talk about our concepts and principles within relational health, it's a dyadic experience. It's meaningful for both. Certainly, babies draw us into relationship with them, as do parents draw babies into relationships with them. And it's mutually valuable. And Cynthia, that brings me back to a comment you made about shared emotional experience. Can you lean in on that a little bit? What does that mean, how to, moving beyond scientific clinical thinking? What does that mean? And why is it important, do you think? And how do you think about it? I think that reciprocity in relationships is valuable. Um, and I think that when a parent doesn't get a response from an infant or an infant doesn't get a response from the parent, that's a disruption. It's um, it's an opportunity for repair, right? We're not gonna have 100% hit all the time. Um, our bids for interaction are always gonna be reciprocated. Um, but I remember probably a decade or so ago, a researcher talking to me about the value of repair. And that's always stood with me because I think that's such a hopeful message um, that that there's an opportunity that when things aren't really connecting, that we can try differently, that we can persist. I love what Sheila said about like how much parents are wanting to engage with their infants and try different strategies um, and make those connections, have those moments. Um, and sometimes we don't get it right at first. Um, and I think strengths-based messaging and messaging that honors the parent's voice and the parent's experience is really important to our message around early relational health. Um, David, you said something about the child bringing something to the interaction. And I, and I wanted to come back to that because I think that a lot of our focus, at least on the, in the field of parent-infant relationships, from my perspective, my take on the literature, is it's been very heavily focused on the parents and the parents' behavior which has tremendous value from the point of education and intervention. But my hesitancy or my caution is that I don't want to engage in, in parent blaming or parent shaming, and that I want to support parents in saying, hey, your baby's bringing something to the table here too. You know, what's your baby giving you to work with here? Um, how's your baby signaling to you? Um, how's your baby telling you they're enjoying this interaction? And getting beyond the language of what parents need to do to right. their infant or for their infant, right. and more into the language of what they can do with their infant. And I think that subtle language shift is really powerful. And I suspect that Adriana, in your work with Wega Camigo, that that's part of your messaging. It's just like, how can you enjoy this time with your very young child, zero to three, right? Like, how can you foster a sense of enjoyment? What do you enjoy? Do you have some um, maybe feedback from parents about what it's been like for them to connect with their child in a way around enjoyment? And Adriana, can I weigh in to add to your, your comment? And that is, I feel so strongly that children develop parents too. And first parents with first babies, they know how much they learn from their children itself. Secondly, so much of our culture believes that parenting has to be you know, utilitarian, the building of skills rather than experiencing the moment. And I believe deeply that human development is so much about in the moment, not always you know, building capacity. It's that experiential moment that really, that emotional connection really matters. So Adriana, what do you, like back to Cynthia's question, what are you witnessing? How do you experience parents talking in this space? Yes, when they talk about babies, just this morning, a mom told me at the end of the program, Adriana, is there uh, any exercises or any games or any activities I can do with my baby? Because I don't know, like, you know, he's too little, maybe he's not learning anything. So that's typical with young babies. And I was talking to her about, you know, there are many opportunities through that the baby, if it's an infant, the infant is sleeping, but he has an alert time. And during that time, the way you talk, the way you use the objects with the baby, just tiny time, just creating, like David was saying, is the experiences rather than just like we have an agenda and we always have to have like, okay, today we're teaching you this. It's just like connect with your baby. That's number one. In our program, for example, we play with bubbles all the time. And for me, 
bubble time becomes an opportunity to help parents with babies to read those baby cues. They might not be talking to you, but they, they might be telling uh, to you whether they like those bubbles a lot, whether it's too much, or like even when we play, like we have a popular game called Rapido Lento Alto, which means fast, slow, and stop. Okay, bless your baby looking around the room and we we uh, we bring and I can even demonstrate this for you because I do it better if I demonstrate. So I have my drum and I have my drum knows three words. If I go rapido, rapido, fast, 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 you will really fast. If you go, if my drum goes slow, slow, you will really slow. If my drum goes stop, we all go. And we have the, the babies, they are reacting to this. Then I go around and I ask, can you tell me how do you like, how, how do you like this drum to go now? I ask the older kids and when I get to the babies, I ask the parents, tell me, how do you think your baby likes this? What, and what I mean is, what have you been observing? How is your child reacting to this experience? And then they can tell me, okay, he likes uh, to, go slow or he likes really fast he's smiling a lot that kind of thing so for me it's about the experience so that object that toy that play is so facilitating the experience relationally which is really striking that brings a question that we wanted to bring forth and how do you think about the differences of toys or objects and how they promote different skills what are your thoughts about that? We talk a lot about reading and, you know, the reach out and read a book effort and bringing books right into the relationship early is something that's, you know, talked about. It makes me a little uneasy in terms of is that what do we know from the research? But how do you think about the objects or the toys and their purposes? What do we know and what are your reflections? Sheila, any thoughts you want to bring first? That's a really good question. Um, there's when taking a look at the literature, when looking at toys, um, particularly on creating the connection, it's not super clear exactly what's happening. And I think that's why there's so much value in the work that Dr. Frosch, that Cindy's trying to do. Um, definitely toys can foster other skills like learning colors and sorting and toys in themselves. I think Cindy, you were mentioning it's like a, a tool to create an opening of a conversation um, to have a connection with your kid in some way. Um, but I don't know that there's a lot of strong literature out there that says exactly what toys can do in a relational sense, which is, I think, the viable of the conversation that we're having today. Um, I think that toys historically have been used a lot to teach about cause and effect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've got the jack in box. I saw that quite frequently in the videos. They roll it, you know, and there's also like, you know, the mom sharing surprise with the child. Uh, there's a lot of sorting in the videos. There's a little bit of book reading, but in the particular sample that I saw, there wasn't so much. Uh, what was interesting, though, was the, the choices that um, mothers made when trying to interact with their child without toys. There was a lot of singing, using their hands and game playing in that way, and a lot of physical touch, lifting the legs of the infant up and down something that we called in the air play. So bringing up the child up if the mother's on the back is like a horsey situation. Uh, so it's, it was interesting to, to see the full range of toys that were used, but also choices that mothers made without toys. I remember in some early work I was doing with some video observation work that set the stage for the building of the early relational health screen screening tool. We had long conversations about what kind of objects should we have present in the relational space. And Cynthia, I think you and I talked about this a year ago or so. When we first began a number of years ago where we wanted to do some video work with parent, parent infant toddler interactions, without the presence of toys, if we were just gonna go straight out the relationship, some families were really anxious because they hadn't had a lot of experience of just the relational context. And that raised the, you know, raised a lot of questions for me. And Cynthia, how would you lean in? What are your thoughts about the presence of toys, the absence of toys, or maybe even some of your thinking about book sharing and that space around early childhood? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm really um, glad that you brought up the idea of the early relational health screen and how you were trying to de determine what the best con context is for, for using the screen. 
Um, and, you know, I think back to dissertation research that I did so long ago and how difficult it was, just as you said, David, for some um, parents to engage with their infants without toys. And I think I think we need to be really mindful as researchers and practitioners and recognize that parents come to their interactions with their infants with their own developmental histories, right? And I think about the literature on adult attachment styles. And I think there was actually a quiz this week, maybe in the New York Times or, or on NPR about, it might have been Life Kit on NPR about looking at your adult attachment style just this week. So this information is in the mainstream, right? Um, but I think that, you know, maybe for a parent who is, who has a history of experiencing what my colleague Jamie Hurst and Lena calls um, instrumental care versus nurturing care, like, you know, this idea of engaging face to face may be very overwhelming and very uncomfortable um, versus maybe a parent who comes with a history of having been nurtured themselves. It might be much easier for them to engage their infant without a toy using, you know, touch like Sheila's saying, making physical contact. And so I think that part of our, our job is to be respectful of parents' histories and experiences, um, to find contexts that really capitalize on their strengths, um, and to listen very carefully to the feedback that they give us about what's easy or difficult for them and how they wanna grow in interactions and in their relationships with their infants. Um, you know, I like this idea of books as tools, just like Adriana was saying and Sheila was saying about toys as tools. I like that idea a lot because I think it says the book or the toy is something we're bringing into the relationship, but it's not the foundation for the relationship. And so the extent to which an interaction is really focused on reading each other's cues, looking at each other's faces, making eye contact, sharing emotion, um, having those moments of shared emotional experience, those kinds of things I think are really important. But if, like Adriana was saying before, if the focus is just on the object, like look at the object does, look at the colors, look at the sounds, you may miss those opportunities to really be present with your infant. Does that answer some of what you're asking me, David? Absolutely, Cynthia. It makes me think about how much naturalistically do we know about different cultural, social, cultural, economic groups about how those first months, six months of development proceed around this, you know, the space between the shared emotional experiences and how toys play in to that space. And what do we know naturalistically? Because, you know, this concept of toy pollution, let me bring it forward where it came from, has to do a little bit of my, my age. There was a period before, had, just before Head Start got going, when we saw so many children that were developmentally behind and in their environments that were unfortunately often, often poor and had little resources. There was a lot of what we used to talk about as relative neglect. And then there became a movement about early intervention. And right along with early intervention came, it became discovery toys and stimulation toys. And that moved into the culture. And now think about no matter what socioeconomic level, the number of objects, that now exist in the environment. That raised a question for me. Secondly, I witnessed that some kind of toys would hold the attention of a baby rather than the face. I witnessed that straight on. Some toys are very stimulating. And I, in my own development as a developmentalist, you know, where the eyes are is where the attention is. And even though looking at faces and then back to objects can go very quickly, I worry about its development and then how much social referencing or the failure of social referencing gets built early and whether or not the object space where there's a lot um, or the attention that shifts the focus of a baby's interaction away from interaction to an object, how that plays out in then social emotional development, executive function system development, early learning, that regulation of affect that's so desperately a part of the relational experience. So I've made it very complicated very quickly, but I've been thinking about naturalistic development. What do we know by watching Native American communities? 
Native Alaskan communities, um, various um, indigent cultures, the immigrant populations, the, you know, the collective populations. What do we know about this space naturalistically before we imbue it with Western culture views about attachment one-on-one -on -one and the like? That's, for me, a very, very curious space. What are your thoughts or experience? Adriana, what do you witness? How do you think about this by what you know, people you've been with? Sheila, same thing, Cynthia, to you. So the first thing I'm thinking is objects can also become toys. So it depends on the accessibility to toys and materials that uh, people use things in different ways. And I also, I, I keep thinking about one of the activities that we do in Play With Me where we use no toys. We have like boxes and we haven't done it in a while, but we used to bring like just things from the environment, a box, a pillow, uh, a bottle, and let the children explore that. And they were like entertained. And that's and that's also what parents tell me. Like I bring up uh, an expensive toy and my child play with that for a few minutes. And then I bring the box and they want to play with that the entire time. And I think of like those cultures or those places where families don't have access to fancy toys and they use like paper plates, they use whatever is in the environment. I'm originally from Colombia and I also remember in certain areas in my country seeing the children making their own uh, soccer balls out of uh, plastic, out of any materials that could find. So objects can also, if create give the, the children the opportunity and even adults to be more creative and to expand like let's think about children when they have to come up with the idea of okay i don't have a ball but what can i do to have one so they start creating they start thinking being creative solving problems and you know being scientists because they have to okay i have this problem now i have to find a solution and i and they have to test different uh like methods and theories to they create their own theory to make this happen. So that's my my naturalistic no, that's observation beautiful. and take on that. It makes me think of two things. One, Piaget talked about sensory motor development, which is explorative. In a safe, secure, stable, safe environment, the exploration is really important, as well as the relational exploration. It also makes me think of remember a number of years ago that movie Babies that look cross culturally? Remember that? And remember that one little infant that was exploring with touching knives, touching things that were in the environment that were a part of the living experience as a part of a learning process. Objects were a part of it and they became interactive space. That also jumps out to me in my thinking too. Sheila, Cynthia, your thoughts? I'm going to pitch to Cynthia um, and maybe she can kind of outline the work that we're doing and I can give some some numbers when she's done about what we're seeing because it is at home. The, the videos recorded were at home. Um, so it might be helpful to conversation. Great. Yeah, it's funny, David, when you were talking, I was thinking about that documentary, Babies, and I, I have long shown that in various undergraduate classes that I teach because I think it's a great illustration of number one, the assumptions we have um, or the biases we have and the, um, the judgments we make about interaction and um, in other cultures and so it's powerful for that reason but also because of what you're you know you're both saying about the ability to create to use objects to just find things that in the environment that are just everyday right. objects that they can make a part of their play experience because right. that is how children learn right through play right. um i think there are some researchers who've done um wonderful work in this area. The first one coming to mind was one of, um, is Catherine Thomas Lamanda. She's got some um, great videos where she has really looked at different styles of communication during parent-child interaction um, based on culture. And so I think that her work is the first thing that jumped out to me. I know that Adriana, that you've done, um, you know, where you've worked with really diverse groups in Dallas, I know that Margaret Owen and her Dallas Preschool Readiness Project um, with Margaret Cahey, I know that they've done some wonderful work in this area. Um, and so, you know, the work is, is there. Um, but I think a lot of the original um, work is more based in anthropology and sociology. Um, and, you know, it, it's helpful sometimes to think about that work that's been done where, where children were observed in 
their their communities and their environments. Um, and think about maybe how we can continue to go back to that work and learn and grow um, as researchers, because the ways that we set up our interaction paradigms for research, you know, contribute to the kinds of data that we get. And so that's one of the questions that Sheila and I are really interested in is how do we create context of interaction or such, you know, situate parents and infants in an interaction paradigm that helps us to really understand what's going on in their families. Do some parents really shine with toys, some in face to face, some with books? And does that mean something different, you know, for children's later executive function, like you mentioned, David, or language skills, social emotional skills? Um, those are the kinds of questions that I hope that that Sheila and I and Margaret and Owen and Sam Reddick will be able to answer with the data that we have, because it's part of a the the videos that we're coding are, are part of the NICHD study of early child care needs development, which followed 1300 families and began in 1991. So we have the opportunity with the shared emotional experience data that we've been working with to look longitudinally and say, do the do the parent infant pairs where there were high levels of shared emotional experience, do they look different later in childhood? Do the children have different regulatory capabilities than um, for children in diets where they didn't have a high level of shared emotional experience? So we're going to be able to look at those data and to, to try to top some of those questions. Those are so important to be to be further explored and to learn from, especially around the power of shared emotional experience. What does it actually mean in terms of developmental outcomes? Can we make those connections? And again, that data is X number of years ago, but that's happening every day in clinical practice and pediatrics and home visiting and early education in every family. Those things matter. And again, back to our treatise about what role do objects play or disruptions to that emotional connection and how do we be careful and being you know cautious and yet also promoting at every time uh, Cynthia you commented about cultural anthropology and you know I'm such a developmental child development nerd I mean I just read everything I can get but when you read naturalistic studies in various first world second world countries from the standpoint of looking at an infant toddler's social emotional interactive experience it's stunning how cute little infants and toddlers create relational experience with themselves because of the complexity of people around them. Objects are a part of it, but objects are, are people are objects of exploration also. And there's a lot of complexity in those interactive spaces because of the multiple social opportunities. Then toys are in the middle of that space of learning. In our culture, right? How many of our young infants, toddlers are by themselves or in small families, right? Our family sizes are down to like 1.7. So a lot of little children don't have as much complex social interactions on one hand. Then often they're grouped by same age groups. And what happens when you put a group of toddlers together? What's interesting to them as they watch together? So I'm just, again, raising the question of how objects play in that social interactive space about building well-being. So you're, you're all researchers, um, Adriana, you're informing all of this. What do you think of the major research questions that are in front of you right now? What are you, I mean, if, what do you really wanna dig into to learn about this place, about the role of objects, toys in promoting that shared emotional experience? Tell me more about what you think are the major research questions that need to be really attended to. I think I want uh, to know more about how we can help parents to be more intentional with toys. How can we, uh, you know, how can we, uh, what you were saying, like that space, how can we help them like connect first so they can be more intentional and use these tools in a way that allow them, allows them to expand and promote their child's development in different ways. And I, because I, I think it's just, uh, I think when we talk to parents about promoting development, 
we're typically thinking about knowledge and having skills for uh, school readiness, but I'm also thinking about the whole child having those experiences that allow them to be successful, not just in a classroom environment, but in life in general. So I want to see more research in that area that help us answer those questions. It's not just about uh, the knowledge, but preventing and helping these children to have the skill to succeed in life in general. Here, here, Adriana, I'm right with you. Sheila, how about you? I mean, your, your budding career is growing with amazing mentors. What, what really excites you to, as you lean forward? Um, so currently, I'm really interested in what the infant brings and how we can understand what the infant is telling us about that, that interaction, the quality of it. And when we see certain behaviors, is that the infant trying to engage more or transition what's going on with, with the parent? And, and how can we better understand what the infant brings to the situation? Um, I really become inspired in listening to Cindy talk about that particular aspect. As a parent myself, I wasn't guided the aspect of, you know, Babies are things to have inputs into, right? You change their diaper, you feed them, you provide stimulation. So I'm really in love with this concept of better understanding what the infant brings to that space twist between so that we can honor what the infant brings and, a better, and better understand how to really infuse early relational health with experiences that are protective and supportive and build brains and bring a relational aspect that is motivating for both partners. Sheila, I'll be watching with deep excitement of your good work. It's moving beyond the, you know, the tabula rasa view of human development that used to be talked about, which is we write who the future of this person is by what we do with them, as opposed to the homunculus view, right, that there's a little person inside that's just going to develop over time. And there's something in between, right, that has to do with one relationship infusing and helping the development of the other person but that's a bi-directional process. I mean, how many of us as parents um, start off one way and how are we shaped as parents by our children over time? And the power of that relational experiencing being a co-developed, co-discovered, co-emergent capacity that really is far beyond the utilitarian view. There's so much to learn there. I also, Sheila, I'm so excited about that way of thinking because as I watch our field, the, the interactive experiences with parents, mothers and fathers, changes parents' brains. There's also a healing force that goes on in that relational experience. There's some really interesting work around the eye contact that babies generate with a caregiver awakens healing forces in the parent's brain of, of attachment as well as safety and security. It's a bi-directional learning process that I think is what allows generations to heal, what allows us as cultures to have survived deep levels of trauma and loss has to be built into the generational developmental system. And so Sheila, I think your work's digging right at that, which is thrilling to me. So now Cynthia, back to you, shared emotional experience. I'm still hung up on that, hung up because I love it. And that that's the, there's a, there's a power in that as you say, the space between that is observable, right? You're working on having it be measurable. And I'm working in many on, and can, ha can we have it um, visible, teachable? Can it be articulated? Can it be awakened? Can it be strengthened? And that space is really so exciting to watch forward. But it brings us to you know, from science and research to translation into recommendations. This is where we all get nervous, right? We've got to be really careful because we've misstepped so many times in recommendations to families. But how do you think from all you know what you're seeing, how would you guide parents about today? You know, the grandparents that are buying toys for their granddaughters for, or their grandsons. The parents themselves that have cute little babies coming along and they're thinking about what objects do I want to have with them and around them? What do we know? How do you think about, what do you recommend to your family, friends, and neighbors from what you know? So let's lean in. Uh, who wants to go first? 
Um, I'll give that one a try. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that I think that making kind of just blanket recommendations is always a challenge, right? Because what if you're a parent who does doesn't fit within that recommendation for some reason? Um, but I think the that what we are learning um, is that conversations with parents that are co-constructed, that are respectful of parents, and that help parents um, to maybe create goals or new awarenesses or pauses in their responses to their infant, that kind of work I think is really powerful. Um, and I think the work at Michigan of the um, Zero to Thrive team, Kate Rosenblum's work um, and her team, um, Jessica Riggs' work, like I think their work is so powerful because it's really about holding space with families. And so I think um, one of the things, one of my recommendations would really be at the professional level. It's just for us not to be the experts, for, not, for us not to be telling parents what to do, but to be really walking alongside of parents in their parenting journey and hearing from them about the ways that they're comfortable engaging their infants, um, what they're telling us about their infant's behavior. I love what Adriana said at the very beginning of our call about the parent who came up afterwards and said, what can I be doing, right? And so just hearing from parents and just being with them um, and generating knowledge and and recommendations I think is really powerful. Um, I'm also very interested, going back to the burning research question is, you know, how do books function in the lives of parents and young children? Um, I think that's a really interesting question that we don't have a lot of data on. Like, do they function more like toys in parent-child interaction or do they function more like, um, like face-to-face -face interactions? You know, like, so I'm sort of like, where, where did, where does that fall in terms of um, a tool for fostering shared emotional experience? So that's one of my burning questions. Um, but in terms of recommendations, I would think, you know, and Adriana, you know this from working with families, it's just following the child's lead, following the child's response, not having your own agenda and letting the child show and tell you what they're interested in. You know, parents often want to move on to the next thing. Um, a baby can do 50 rounds of peekaboo and be completely happy. Um, and so trying to stay with the baby's pace, with their interests, with their emotional experience and what they're telling us, I think is a way to keep that flow of connection going over time. Phenomenal. Uh, Adriana, your thoughts about recommendations that you share with your families, your own family, your friends, how do you think about this space? Yes, I'm thinking of a recommendation also for professionals before I think of what I recommend to parents is that we don't have to, we can give the questions back to the parents. Like in the Play With Me program, when they ask a question and I'm training students, I also tell them, we don't have to have all of the answers. Let's ask them back. When they, when they have a question about parenting, about development, we can say, what? That's an interesting question. What do you think? And we have, we start the conversation with them rather than us always trying to tell them like, this is what works. This is what research says. Tell me what is working for you. What are you doing that has, that keeps working? Or even tell me what are you doing that is not working? Let's, let's uh, kind of like explore this together. And I think we're going to get, to gain uh, rich information and even consider more questions for more uh, research questions in the future. So for parents, what I think of, uh, when I think of toys and when they ask me, one, one question that they ask me a lot is what kind of toys should I buy? Or like, especially my, my friends, oh, I have to have a, when they need, you know, when they get invited to birthday parties, things like that, what kind of toys should I buy? What I tell them is like, don't think of the expensive toys, in this case, basic toys are better, traditional toys, things that encourage exploration, things that encourage uh, that interaction. Like if I have in, in my program, in the Play With Me program, I can set um, like blocks and books together in a way that is inviting, that creates an opportunity for children and parents to start uh, figuring out different things. Or if I said a doll just by itself, that doesn't invite anybody to play. But if I said a doll and around that doll, I have like a doctor set, 
that creates an opportunity for interaction. So if you're thinking about buying toys for your children, think of what are, be intentional. Think of what are the skills that my child can learn through this toy. Also think of, uh, don't think of very specialized toys. We can think of toys that can, your child can outgrow and they're very simple things like blocks. Babies can play with blocks. They can explore those blocks, but a toddler can start doing more things. A preschooler can even do more. So it's just, we don't have simple is more in this situation. And toys, I have to say this, we think of toys and we look for the coolest gadgets, the ones that have the more noises and do more. In our program, for example, we don't allow those toys. We want those toys to be as simple as possible because we want the child to be in charge of the experience, to be in charge of the play rather than a toy. And I also have to mention tablets because these days we're using those objects like any electronics as toys. So I want to tell the parents, yes, we I cannot tell them not to use anything. Don't ever get something like that for your child. If you do, Okay, if you do, just be also intentional and think of what are the, the opportunities that your child is missing when he is in front of the screen 24-7. Because uh, it can be convenient to have, okay, have it for one minute while mom makes a phone call. But we cannot replace the parent-child interaction with mm -hmm. anything. You are, the parent is the most important tool in that moment. The most important toy is the parent, and the other things become like uh, additional additional elements to enrich the interaction and to help children uh, develop different skills. I'm so really excited, sorry. <laughs> the wisdom that's coming through, I just love. Can I hazard to try to echo a couple of things you mentioned that I think are really brilliant? One is, is keep it simple. And the more that the objects are one where the imagination is built around the object rather than the object defining the imagination is really important. I also believe that objects that serve the relationship or the imitation of others in the relationship are really powerful. Objects that serve solely the function of self-play, young may be, could be problematic at certain stages. So again, I'm right with you as to how do the toy, the objects, especially under a year, promote either imitative processes or interactive processes rather than self-isolation processes in human development or things I think a lot about. Mm -hmm. Sheila, I want to give you a chance for your recommendations. I'm going to come back around to each one of you because amazingly, we're coming towards the end. I told you it would go fast, but I'm going to want your final thoughts about this toy pollution concept. But Sheila, your recommendations you would give to parents, friends, family? So Adriana hit on them, um, basically center the experience and what the parents' goals are. What is the, what is the, what, what are the major concerns that, what do you, what do the parents want to have happen? And then center it, focus more on where the child is and where the interest of the child is. Um, but then it kind of can be hard because you get, they don't talk, um, but there are different ways in which you can engage infants. And if you, um, are supportive of parents and what their parents want to do. I think that's a better place to start rather than coming in with your own ideas of what you think is really cool or what your friend said was really cool. So as far as making decisions about purchasing toys, I think it um, should rest in what the the parent with the parents' goals with the infants are with their children are. Um, I don't know if that answered the question, but that's what came to mind. Just an echo of what Adriana said. Phenomenal. Okay, so each of you get about two minutes for summary thoughts around this toy pollution question. And Cynthia, can I come to you? Then we'll go to Sheila, and then Adriana, you can finish up, and then we'll come to a conclusion. So Cynthia, your first closing thoughts. Yeah, so I like this idea of being really intentional and encouraging parents to be intentional. They may not have a lot of time you know, to really sit down and engage one-on-one. -on -one, you know? um, and so being intentional about, about connecting with the child, following the child's lead, um, recognizing that even very young babies, although they may not be using, 
you know, complex words, but that they're communicating with babbles and coos and their eye contact and the responsiveness to you is just kind of just saying that that communication pattern begins, you know, at birth um, and that there's so many opportunities there to to cultivate shared emotional experiences over time. Um, I think it just in terms of my closing thoughts, I mean, I think, David, just the fact that you brought us all together today to have this uh, conversation is so exciting. I mean, I love your term toy pollution because it's really helped our team think about the role of toys in interactions um, and thinking about the kind of research that we want to conduct going forward. Um, I, I think my closing thoughts would be I'm really excited about what Sheila's been able to work on with these data and to just be able to so clearly see differences in frequency and duration of shared emotional experience based on whether the initiation from the parent is toy-based or non-toy-based. Like that is just really exciting to me um, as an early childhood mental health professional. And I just want to affirm and just say there are so many amazing people in research practice and policy who care about the issue of early relational health. And it's just really exciting to see this term grow and this focus grow and so many people from pediatricians to early childhood educators, to child care providers, to parents, practitioners, really just all caring about a broader perspective on children's early networks of relationships. And I think that that's good for the field and it's good for babies and families. So thank you for bringing us together. Thanks, Cynthia. It's a movement and we're all a part of it because we know our children are struggling and we're all trying to contribute all from what we know to have that shift and change. Sheila, your final thoughts, and then to Adriana. When I first started learning with Cindy about the space between, what's happening between parents and infants, I just, I thought of like um, an equal sign as like a pause. Hmm. And uh, as we think about toy choice and how many toys is more or less, what I do see when I'm coding is that the, the importance of this idea of a pause, the space between, so the mom can recognize what the infant is bringing to the interaction. And so if, if we can approach how we interact with our kids and our infants with a little bit like, let's kind of go a little bit slower to, to kind of make those connections, create those moments where we're reflecting and seeing what's being brought, I think we'll be able to make better decisions around toys. Um, I'm fascinated. I have a tendency to want like answers now. I'm a little impatient. It's done well for me, but sometimes it's hard for me too. Uh, so I'm appreciating the the opportunity to also just reflect back in as we seek out answers. Sometimes it's best to have that pause and be reflective and and take in all the different contexts and the parameters that are what are going on in order to make good decisions. Um, and maybe sometimes it's not about what we know, but about how well we can ask questions. So I've appreciated the chance to get together here and to think about things and think about new questions and how to approach it. Sheila, that's phenomenal. Um, that sense of pause, that sense of wonder, that sense of delight. Our colleague, Jen Wei Lee, talks about simple interactions, those brief moments. And I actually believe that in human development, those are actually just brief moments but they have to be there that are really required. And so we're talking about that space. I like you have the same urgency. I mean, I got babies born every day, right? And they either are gonna fly along well or they're gonna get into challenges that I'm really worried about. So that urgency works me as it does you. So Adriana, back to, to you, your final closing thoughts, please. So thank you again for the opportunity to have this conversation with all of you. I really enjoyed it. And I think of that concept of pausing, like I teach that to parents, like I have a toy in front of you, have a toy in front of the child and wait for the reaction and see what happens. And from there, yeah, you can you can decide what to do. So for us professionals too, it's like we don't have to have all of the answers, all of this. We can pause and see and observe what's happening with children and parents out there. I also keep thinking about what works for different cultures for different parents and how we can kind of like um, collect that information and put it all out there. This is working for this parent, it might work for you. So the more we learn about the parents and what works for them, the more we can help them. 
Adriana is so true. Celebrating the wisdom that's deep in cultures and histories and memories and experiences and using that to help guide us is also a part of this early relational health journey. And that actually helps. I'm going to come to our close, but foreshadow next month, because next month we're actually going to talk about some work about that's been built around early relational health conversations and creating a space within the medical home for listening. And the title of some work that's been done by my colleagues, Marie Celeste Condon and Dominique Charlotte Sweeley, is sitting at the feet of the storytellers, listening deeply to the family experiences of the moment as a part of building a relational health frame. So join us next month. My thanks to Cynthia, to you and your my new friends now, Sheila, Adriana. Great conversation. I wish you all well and uh, continue on your good work. Let's keep close touch and and keep having this movement go forward for all of us. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.